Sacramento's event. Attending today are representatives of several nonprofits with outreach tables here. And if they will stand up and wave, as I mentioned, each, there's no need to clap until the end. Uh, just eyeball the people, and you can say hi when you visit their outreach table later on if you haven't already done so. We have the National Center for Science Education, Glenn, Camp Quest West, David, the Sacramento Area Skeptics, Sam, the Humanist Association of the Greater Sacramento Area, Bill and Wendy, the Americans United for Separation of Church and State, Jack, and uh, the local American Civil Liberties Union chapter, Adriana and Mary. Da -da. Now you can clap. <laughs> if you haven't had a look around those tables yet, please do visit our sponsors before you leave today. We organizers call Sacramento Celebration an educational gala. The main program is to educate, and so we invite speakers each year who will help us uh, on that go. But the day is a social event also. So besides turning your brains onto science with some science visuals and music, uh, after the presentation, we're going to turn this into a birthday party. And we're going to show our gratitude for Darwin's proposition and reaffirm his momentous idea by eating up his birthday cake and having a bit of camaraderie. So be sure to check out the cartoons along the wall over there. And if you're in the mood for some Darwin-related merchandise to wear home or to put in your car, I noticed Darwin's ghost is over there to help us out with that part. We organizers uh, want the Darwin Day in Sacramento, which was begun by free thinkers, to become a community-wide science event. And we've made some progress on that score, at adding the educational sponsors, getting wider notice in local media, and being contacted by groups who would like to participate, such as those EV cars out there. Uh, we hope you'll stop by after the program's totally over and uh, check out an electric uh, vehicle. Uh, we have a, an interest in anybody and everybody who cares about science. Now, Charles Darwin has just become the symbol of scientific advancement that can and should be promoting a common bond among all of Earth's peoples, not divisions over ideology, especially between some religions and secularism. Those continue to impede educational progress. It's important to recognize, and we organizers do, that the great, there's a great diversity of folks who appreciate how important evolutionary theory has been to human understanding of the natural world. And in the current political and social context, we all must now work harder than ever to preserve sound science as a hope for humanity. And we need allies in our desire to succeed in that preservation. And they're out there, so next year, be sure, bring your family, bring your friends, bring your acquaintances, but in the meantime, enjoy the day. Okay, I don't know if you can still hear me while I readjust the mic here. Uh, next up we have the Mockingbirds. Are you in the house? Yes. yes. <laughs> and they are going to perform, I hope. You'll recognize them by their distinctive white lab coats. Sacramento's first, maybe only, atheist choir. We sing songs about science. We sing um, so pirate songs for the Flying Spaghetti Monster, too. And we're always looking for new members, so we'd love to have you in choir and join us. You don't have to be good. Uh, you just have to have a willingness to sing. 
So the first song we have for you today is called Darwin Song. Um, this was, uh, these are typical hymns that you might find in church with new lyrics. <laughs> Evolution gave us love. 
creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, evolution made us all. It made the strong bacteria, the virus and the flu. <laughs> it made the tree frog and the squid. It made both me and you. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, evolution made us all. It gave us brains to reason, to question what we think. It made homo erectus and it made each missing link. All things wise and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, evolution made. you is uh, by the band Chamba Wamba. You may recognize it. It's uh, a dedication to Charles Darwin, but they call him Charlie. So here we go. So let's have another hand for the Bogging Birds. They are awesome. I'm also proud to say we're not late. Okay, a couple things I want to mention uh, before we get to the main event, if you will. And that in the uh, 113th Congress, <laughs> sorry, I was thinking of a joke that really is inappropriate for this venue. So uh, I'll move on. It's about the 112th Congress. You know, you know those guys. 113th Congress, uh, there was an actual resolution introduced, and it looks like it's a House resolution in the U.S. Congress, I should point out, uh, expressing support for the designation of February 12, 2013 as Darwin Day and recognizing the importance of science and the betterment of humanity. So I'd like to read that now, if I may. 
It was a Mr. Holt that submitted the following resolution, which is uh, referred to the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Now, uh, I don't know if it's still in committee. I don't know if it's been sent to the floor. I don't know if it's been voted on, because this was on the 22nd of January. But if it's still held up in committee, and you happen to have a congressman that's on that committee, you might want to drop them a nice line. Resolution, expressing support for designation of February 12, 2013 as Darwin Day and recognizing the importance of science in the betterment of humanity. Whereas, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by the mechanism of natural selection, together with the monumental amount of scientific evidence he compiled to support it, provides humanity with a logical and intellectually compelling explanation for the diversity of life on Earth. Whereas, the validity of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is further strongly supported by the modern, uh, modern understanding of the science of genetics. Whereas, it has been the human curiosity and ingenuity exemplified by Doran that has promoted new scientific discoveries that have helped humanity solve many problems and improve living conditions. Whereas the advancement of science must be protected from those unconcerned with the adverse impacts of global warming and climate change. Whereas the teaching of creationism in some public schools compromises the scientific and academic integrity of the United States education systems. Whereas Charles Darwin is a worthy symbol of scientific advancement on which to focus and around which to build a global celebration of space, uh, sorry, science and humanity intended to promote a common bond among all of Earth's peoples, and whereas February 12, 2013 is the anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin in 1809 and would be an appropriate date to designate as Darwin Day. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the House of Representatives, one, supports the designation of Darwin Day, and two, recognizes Charles Darwin as a worthy symbol on which to celebrate the achievements of reason, science, and the advancement of human knowledge. That's the resolution. I think it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, if I keep speaking in legalese any longer, I'm going to lapse into my old, you know, vestigial British accent. You certainly don't want that. So I'll move on. Uh, Dr. Schwab, I think uh, we have your computer not in sleep mode, and I'll do the introduction now, if that's all right. Ivan R. Schwab, MD, is a professor of ophthalmology, not optometry, and not optical school. I want to make this distinction, because a lot of people don't understand that there are three different branches. There's optometrists, there's opticians, and ophthalmologists. He's an ophthalmologist, so I, I assume that means he can prescribe drugs. Now, at the University of California, Davis, and the author of a book entitled Evolution's Witness, How Eyes Evolved, which was named one of the 12 best science books in 2011 by Scientific American. He will discuss the evolution of the eye and illustrate how eyes developed, and we will see a little bit more about that momentarily when he comes up. Dr. Schwab is a graduate of West Virginia University where he received his BA in biology and his MD, completing his residency at the Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco and following three fellowships in ophthalmology, Dr. Schwab returned to uh, <clears throat> West Virginia University. I look at the abbreviation, I get confused. As a faculty member in the School of Medicine for seven years. In 1989, he moved to the University of California, Davis, and has been on his faculty since then as professor of ophthalmology. Again, that's ophthalmology, not optimism. He has an active practice and is engaged in research on ocular surface disease, and in 1999 was the first person in the United States to successfully transplant bioengineered tissue to the ocular surface. From our perspective, for those of us that really appreciate science, however, it is one of his achievements that I find most notable, and that is the fact that he is also a winner of a Nobel Prize, the Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. He won the 2006 Ig Nobel Prize in Ornithology for his research on why woodpeckers do not suffer retinal detachments, among other problems like skull fractures, brain damage, and all that, when they bang their head against a tree. <laughs> and although we don't have the actual image to show you of him receiving his prize, he was appropriately attired for the occasion. So those of you who have Wi-Fi are now going to Google and look that up. That's good. <laughs> so without too much further ado, Dr. Schaub, we can introduce you to the podium. I'm sorry, the lectern. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Certainly an honor to celebrate Darwin's birthday. 
Uh, I want to talk to you about what has been in the past a controversial issue, and that is the I, by some, is thought to be irreducibly complex. That is, it cannot just have arisen de novo, it had to have been created. And that's simply nonsense. And I'm going to show you why and how some eyes evolved. And there are many forms of eyes. Did you ever wonder how it all began and why we have eyes at all? It's all based on the electromagnetic spectrum, on the visible and the nearly visible light. It's the principal source of energy. If you think about the 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th sunsets and sunrises, that has been the entire source of energy. About 4.5 billion years ago, when Earth was created, roughly, of course it was too hot, too inhospitable to life, but about 3.9 billion years, nucleic acids, RNAs, membranes began to appear. And the earliest organisms appeared about 3.75 billion years ago. Now I'm going to show you um, a timeline that you have on your chair as a handout, but also there's a timeline here at the bottom of the slide. Um, there's a little arrow, we'll show you the timeline to give you a rough idea because I'm going to move quickly. I'm, uh, in the next six hours, I'm going to try to cover <laughs> <laughs> Try to cover 3.9 billion years. <laughs> so we know the earliest organisms appeared about 3.75 billion years ago. And that's with a B, and that's hard for us to get. So what did life look like? Well, life came on as early single cell organisms. <coughs> Membranes, and cytoplasm, and really no nucleus. And the first organisms were probably like the stromatolites off of uh, Western Australia, um, it's an anaerobic environment, it, it still harbors these uh, organisms. They weren't an algae, they're called a blue-green algae, but really they're a primitive bacteria. So what did that initial cell, what did that cell capture? How did it begin to evolve? Well, it started by getting a compound known as retinol. You may have heard of this as visual purple. It's the compound that can change configuration within your eye, change configuration, and deliver energy deliver a stimulus. But it didn't start as an eye, nor did it start as a light receptor for light sake, but rather as an energy source. It's called a proton pump. Evolution co-opted it to use in the eye. Multicellular organisms, as they came along, would add another protein called an opsin. And the opsin allows this retinol, which changes configuration and signals when light hits it. It allows the retinol to choose which wavelength is most predominantly used. So that gives us the blue, the reds, the greens. It gives us more the selection of what wavelength we use. And the eye genes, the genes to make an eye, really to make a head and then make the eye, were also produced early. These are called patch genes. Doesn't matter about the name, but what it does tell us is that these genes are very similar across large number of organisms, even single cell organisms. So we know that patch genes arrived early. They too evolved. They've even appeared in primitive or basal organisms, I should say. Coral, volvox, very basal organisms, and yet they have patch genes. Then as those genes begin to evolve, multiply, different ones, different proteins tend to be brought in, they become downstream genes. That is, they mold how the head and the eye would then form. But this was all controlled underwater. So phototropism underwater was the key, the key selection process. We know that seawater then would determine transmission. Though that the first selection of opsin, that is a selection protein, was probably in the blue, the green, ultraviolet maybe, uh, but a single wavelength, colorblind if you will. And I said it started as a proton pump, not as an eye. Now I'm going to jump from 3.75 to 2.2 billion years ago, called the Proterozoic Era. And about this time, those stromatolites, those blue-green algae, had been giving off a waste product. And that waste product was oxygen. The oxygen in the atmosphere would kill many of those cells. They couldn't tolerate oxygen. It was a, it was a waste product and toxic to them. Those are called anaerobes. The anaerobes then were beginning to be wiped out by this production of oxygen. 
But some cells both had obtained a nucleus as well as um, an organelle called a mitochondrion inside of it, inside the cell, that helped it utilize the oxygen as a food source and an energy source. That would then give us protozoa, that is, single cells with a nucleus. Now, many of these cells by this time had become photosensitive. That is, they recognize light, they can go towards it, they can go away from it, phototaxic. What they could do then was congregate those, those individual light sensing molecules into little dots, like you see here. This is Euglena, alive and well today. It's an eye spot. Now, in my book, I don't classify this as an eye because all it does is recognize light and dark. But this is the source of eye spots, the collection of those chemicals within the cellular membrane. Now, we think that we are all built on these organisms, but that's nonsense, too. Each organism evolves on its own, and each organism is as well suited for its environment as we are for ours. So the protozoa, the primitive eye, the ones with the primitive eye spots, would evolve also. And the way they would evolve would be that they too would evolve an eye. So this is an animal called Erythrodineopsis that is a single cell that has the smallest known eye. And here it is. It has a lens. It has a little pigment cup. And within this lens, the membrane that surrounds the whole organism is folded so that there's lots of visual pigment in there. This senses light. It even senses spatial detail. In other words, it can tell another organism and it can chase it. It's a predator. So even the individual cells have evolved to fit their environment. This, by the way, is about 50 microns. Um, just to help you with that, it's about a tenth or a little less than a tenth of the width of your cornea. Little tiny thing. And yet it has an eye. So even single cells would go on to evolve eyes of their own. Now the cells, individual cells, had eye spots. They had a nucleus. They could work with oxygen. And now they begin to collect together. Think of it like a condominium. They have a condominium, a high rise. And this condominium begins to be congregated and welded together, but they don't work together. Pretty soon they realize that by dividing tasks, they'd be more efficient and hence more competitive. Natural selection would then eventually make it into an organism, and that's probably the source of sponges. Now, sponges are light sensitive, but they do not have any form of an eye, but they're very light sensitive. They use light to help, uh, um, help mate, essentially, by giving off eggs and sperm. Now, sponges give off polyps to to expand their numbers, to um, essentially to mate. Those polyps will come off and settle elsewhere. As they settle elsewhere, then they grow into sponges, new sponges. But not all of them would settle. And this is probably the source of jellyfish. Those polyps would eventually evolve into a lineage of jellyfish. Now, jellyfish turned out to be what I would call a cul-de-sac that is essentially blind. We don't like to talk about anything in ophthalmology being blind, but it's a blind cul-de-sac, meaning it hasn't radiated into anything else, although it has expanded and been very successful. Jellyfish are quite successful, and they too have evolved. Just like those single-cell organisms, jellyfish have evolved their own set of eyes. Now, not all, and most of them are just merely light-sensitive, but here's one about as big as your thumb, called Trichodelia cystophora. Trichodelia cystophora can be found in the Caribbean. It's set about as big as the joint on your thumb. It has four bell cords that hang down on its side. It's a box jellyfish, not poisonous. And each box side has a ropilia, a little bell cord that hangs down. And at the tip of that bell cord, you can see um, a little knob. And at the tip of that knob is a little bell with six eyes. The main eye here in the center reacts to light. It has a pupil. And if you look real carefully, histologically, under a microscope, it sure looks like an eye. Here it is with a cornea, with a lens, and with a pigment backing, looking a lot like your eye.
So what we found then is that even jellyfish have pushed the envelope to evolve an eye. But they show us one other thing. They tell us then that the eye in many ways has preceded the brain. So for those of you that learn in embryology that the eye is an outpouch of the brain, I say piffle. <laughs> the brain is an outpouch of the eye. Now, it may seem a little parochial for an ophthalmologist to say that, but the truth is that sensory mechanisms push the development of neurology. If you're hired for a job and you go into a room and have just a desk and you start writing out papers, you'll stack the papers, you don't need any file cabinet for those papers until they're so big you can't find your way through those papers. When the horizontal vertical stacking system you have doesn't work, that's when you need a file cabinet behind you. So you don't need a brain to interpret signals until you get so much information that you need to work with that information and interpret it. So in many ways, sensory mechanisms with the eye as a proxy have led the development of the brain. Now I'm asked, what is the first known eye? Well, the first known eye is in the trilobite. For those of you that know the uh, organism, it, they've been called stone bugs. They, most of them would fit in your hand. They're extinct now. Um, these, this is the dorsum, the back of the animal, and you can see this is a hard shell. It's an arthropod. You can see the head here and these two eyes, which I'm going to show you in a little more detail. These are complex eyes, and these complex eyes have what are known as omatidia. Omatidia are the individual units of the eye, very much like the individual units of a fly's eye. So when you see a fly or a hornet land in a picnic table, and you see the little tiny facets, the individual units, those are called omatidia. So these omatidia-like elements are complex, surprisingly complex. We know this because this is the first animal that fossilized an eye because the lenses were made of calcite. The cliffs of Dover are made of calcite. So this is a, a um, lens that fossilized and allows us to understand its optics, what it saw, how good it was. It was probably colorblind. It probably saw only blue light. But it had this sophisticated lens system to make that sharp. And this is probably where the first known brain comes. <coughs> so by this time, the images were becoming so complex that this brain had to appear, begin to store and work with these. Now if you take that same picture I showed you and then turn it to the side to look at the eye, here is the individual eye, and here are these individual elements. Here is the one single, another one. You can see how they're arrayed. There are two lenses consecutive here. Doesn't matter what it's called, but these lenses consecutively are used to correct for aberration, for the imperfect focusing of light. This might be what it looked like. This is an artist's rendition of the early Cambrian, about 543 million years ago, with the first trilobite known to have eyes, probably relatively primitive eyes. So how'd that look? Well, maybe it looked like this. This is not Olin Ellis, the first known eye. <clears throat> But probably a few of those eye spots collected together, genetic duplication, and you begin to have a collection of these little spots. And here is that particular trilobite, uh, the dorsum, the back of that trilobite. I've mentioned the Cambrian explosion. Now, this was approximately 543 million years ago, and it was a dynamic time for life. There was enough oxygen, and now there were enough sensory mechanisms to see one another and to begin to attack. So it's a predator-prey competition, as it were. This is a key of natural selection. There was a fantastic array of phyla, different kinds of animals, different kinds of lineages would appear. Many of those would be winnowed out. We now have only about 36 phyla, and of those, only seven phyla really have eyes. And of those, there are three major groups. And those three major groups account for 96% of the animals on Earth and all of them have eyes. You can see the importance of, of eyes. But let's look at a few of the organisms you might have seen in those early seeds. This is Animalocarus, and this would look like a ray. It's a flat organism, an undulated, very much like a ray. You can see the shield here at the front. These two head shields are now known to have been compound eyes, very much like the, the shrimp you might see, uh, or maybe you don't see its head, but the shrimp, if you if you get a whole or a live shrimp, you very much like those eyes. 
And this is Raptia, another arthropod. Note these two little eyes at the front. We don't know what kind they were. There's enough detail in the fossil. These did not fossilize. These were impressions because these were all soft-bodied organisms. And soft-bodied organisms don't fossilize. And here's an artist's rendition of what the Cambrian seas probably look like. This is Animalocris. Animalocris is about three or four feet long. The largest about four feet. Note the eyes are on the side completely. No stereo vision. And note these odd, weird organisms that would eventually be winnowed out because they're, they didn't fit, they didn't work in other environments. They did work in this one, however. So we're left with three major groups, the mollusks, the arthropods, and the chordates. That's us, that have eyes, and they, as I say, account for 96% of the species. Now, I mentioned many slides ago that Early evolution picked out the key basic molecules, chemicals for the eye. But there were other chemicals to be selected. They were selected much later. For instance, lenses. Lenses, the focusing element, these do not have common origin. And you can see across the phyla, many of the lenses have different chemicals. Some are minerals, like the trilobites. But all of these are, uh, depending on the lineage, are very different. But let me talk about a few of these interesting aquatic eyes. The one you see, I've talked about the, calibite, the, the uh, trolobites and the calcite lenses. The one you see here to the right is called Pontella. Now, the Pontella is a copepod, and it's tiny, less than half an inch. And it looks like a shrimp. You'd say, well, that's a baby shrimp. It isn't. It's a copepod. And this photograph I've taken is looking up at its belly. On the top, on the dorsum, there are two eye spots that have just begun to form cups. They're poor eyes. But this one isn't. This is a nocular eye, and it really hangs down about where you think the nose ought to be. It has three consecutive lenses, two lenses, a space where seawater can go between, and then a, another lens right in front of the retina. And the retina consists of six photoreceptors. Furthermore, they're not arrayed in any organized fashion, it would seem, but they're asymmetrically aligned in what is known as a center surround pattern. The center has a bigger, a bigger cell than the cells that surround. So there's emphasis on that center surround system. Why? Well, it turns out this one is only in the males. This is essentially an eye for the ladies. <laughs> the purpose of this eye is to allow the males to find the female, because when they come together, they aggregate in huge aggregations, 96% of which are males. The 4% of the females need to be found by the males to mate. The female are blue with yellow spots. They're a center surround visualization. So, although not proven, it's my thought that this center surround system in the eye and this extra special focusing mechanism to make it focus just perfectly on that retina is meant to see a center surround system. But other unusual lenses of different kind, of different molecules, have appeared in different creatures. This is another copepod, and it gives you an example of different kind of chemical composition of lenses, and note how the lenses are formed. This one, on the front of the carapace, it's yoked to a lens inside of it, and it scans, very much like a raster scan on your TV or your computer screen. You scan a line, scan another, scan another, and then assemble it, all in a very primitive ganglion-like uh, brain. So you can see that evolution has had to cobble together all kinds of different materials to make the lenses, depending on the need and niche of the animal. Now, in the Cambrian period, these eyes that you see in flies and wasps and such, the compound eye would appear. The most common form, there are different forms, by the way, the common form is called the apposition eye. It doesn't matter so much about the name, but it's the form, the design, the anatomy of the eye, and first seen in worms. You don't think of worms of having compound eyes, but that's where it was first seen, and it's even seen there now because I have a picture of a sabellid worm on the right, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's also seen in mollusks shelled animals and in arthropods, and the arthropods really affected it. They're not particularly good eyes, but they're eyes after all. And here is that same sabellid worm, 
These are oceanic creatures. If you're a diver, you've seen this. They're also called Christmas tree worms. And these two stalks have eyes at the tip. I just uh, showed you the eyes, or we'll show you the eyes. And these are lots of eyes covering the complete top. So it's, it's an array, 360 degrees of individual units. You say, what do those look like if you look inside? Well, they look a little bit like ice cream cones, don't they? They're a couple of lenses together, one lens, another lens, and then the retinal part is back here. So it's, it's opposed. One tissue is opposed to another. The two lenses are right next to each other, focusing on the retina. This is not a good eye, but it's used as a burglar alarm because it's able to see formed vision fish coming towards it, predators coming towards it. Now if you look now, hundreds of millions of years later from the worms, you can see that this is a fly's eye called a brachyurine fly. And this fly, by the way, is from the Eocene. That's about 50, 60 million years ago. And this is from amber. This was uh, scanned um, and then false colored uh, in amber by a man named Jess Roost who loaned me this uh, slide. But this same set of omatidia can be seen, and if you open those omatidia, they really look a lot like the worm, the uh, omatidia I showed you earlier. Again, the two lenses, a couple of lenses, and then the retinal elements. So you can see that one step has gone to another. They've modulated, improved, but they're still the same compound eye that started out of the apposition eye. Now, of the opposition eyes, there are six forms at least, and you're going to be really happy that I'm not going through all six of them to tell you about the individual eyes. But suffice to say that they've all come from that stem apposition eye, and they've all radiated into really a, a magnificent array of different optical kinds of eyes. But I do want to tell you about a few of these interesting compound eyes. This one is in a creature known as a mantis shrimp. For you divers, you know this as a thumb splitter. Because if you put your hand into its lair, the thing about the size of a bratwurst, by the way, you put this in your thumb into its lair, it will crack your thumb. If you put it in an aquarium, it'll break the glass on your aquarium if it has a mind to. At the tip of its palp, it has the force of a 22 shell. It's able to hunt by stunning and killing fish or breaking open small shelled animals. The interesting part of this eye, the animal, however, is its eye, it has a total of 16 visual pigments. For reference, you have three. So you see all the colors around you with three visual pigments. This one has 16. You can see well in the ultraviolet, see a wider range of colors than we can. And furthermore, it can see linear and circular polarized light no, I don't quite have my head around circular polarized light either. But the polarization is used to find a mate. And it turns out that females have circular polarized light emanating from it. So it helps them find mates. We don't completely understand what it's doing with all those. Now, I mentioned that there are a lot of different kinds of uh, compound eyes. And there are. And I won't go through all the optics. But here's another set you may wonder about. How on earth do butterflies see, and what do their eyes look like? Well, butterflies have many telescopes. Note how the eye, if you cut it open, how it looks a whole lot like the previous eyes we've been talking about. Optically, it's a little different. I won't go through those details. But the difference in it optically allows it to have a little two to three power microscope to help it find the flowers. Now, I won't tell you a lot about the uh, second major class are refracting superpositional eyes, but they've evolved for nighttime vision. As you might imagine, this, these eyes aren't great, so in order to see better at night, you have to evolve a special kind of eye, and that's the refracting superpositional. It doesn't matter about the name, but what it tells me is that if you have a refracting superpositional eye, you're about a thousand times better in darkness than would an apposition eye be. This is mostly seen in moths and other nocturnal insects. And here's an image of the inside of that eye. And the only key here to tell you is that here are still the two lenses, but all the retinal information is essentially gone. It's well back in the back of the eye. It allows it to be a telescopic effect. So moths have evolved a very special eye that looks a lot like the eye 
the wasps have that's very different. Except for this one. This is a hummingbird hawk moth. It is a moth. It has that same kind of refracting superpositional eye, but it sees very well in daytime, as this picture illustrates. And it uses it to make it about the best compound eye vision, uh, terrestrial anyway, uh, on Earth. So it's almost as good as yours at short range. Now I mentioned that mollusks were the other, one of the other keys. And the mollusks um, exploded during the Cambrian explosion. There was lots of carnivory, lots of predation. This was a predator versus prey. It's a war. And each time, one would evolve a better mechanism of defense, the other would evolve a better mechanism of vision. And the mollusks would evolve special kinds of eyes, from pinholes to a camera-style eye like ours. Ours is a camera-style eye, with mirror optics. For the folks in here who are interested in telescopes, I'm going to show you a mirrored eye that really re resembles a schmidt cassegrain telescope. Let's talk about a few of these eyes. You've probably seen Nautilus. If you've gone to the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, you've seen a Nautilus. Note that these are six reflected in a surface above. But uh, notice there's an eye in the um, a lower corner with a little dot in the center. This is a very simple eye, but it looks a lot like yours in that it is a camera style eye. It has no lens. It has a pinhole. You can see the pinhole there. For you camera buffs, you know that a pinhole camera isn't great, but it will focus an image. It is surprisingly good. And this is a good example of the fact that an eye spot only has to become a bit of a cup and then fold in a little bit to make a pinhole to make a decent eye. I didn't say this is going to read the stock quotes, but this is going to make a decent eye and does for this creature. It uses it to see bioluminescence. But perhaps the most interesting of the mollusks are the octopuses. Now this octopus is uh, Billy. And I had the great pleasure of working with Billy. I went to the, um, cut to the um, Seattle Aquarium. And I thank Roland Anderson for introducing me to Billy. He's a curator there. This animal is about 170 pounds. They can get up to about 250 to 300 pounds. This is a Pacific giant octopus, the largest octopus in the world, and probably the source of many uh, mariner's myth about the size of octopus. But note how odd this eye looks. And just to give you a little perspective, this is another octopus. Billy, Roland told me, very friendly, and she was. She let me get up close to her and work with her, but he said, don't let her take your, her hand to, your, to her mouth. We're not sure what she'd do. Uh, <laughs> I was careful, but she was very gentle with me and let me take photographs and such. So I want to know what was inside that orbit. No, this isn't Billy. <laughs> I thank the Monterey Bay Aquarium for this eye, for this orbit, really. Turns out that when, many of you probably know this, but when octopus are pregnant, uh, the females choose a time to lay their eggs. And when they lay their eggs, concomitant with their egg production, they produce a hormone that completely shuts off their desire to eat. Sounds like we could use some of those hormones in our country, doesn't it? <laughs> but essentially, they starve themselves to death. And so the females are predictably, will predictably die at a certain time because they've laid their eggs, often tens of thousands of eggs, though. They will then have a, a timeline on their death. The Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, was very kind to me, and I said I wanted to an orbit when she died because I knew she was pregnant and laid eggs. So they called me, and so I was able to get this orbit and when you look at the orbit, this eye is about the size of a tangerine. Big, it's a big eye. But look how it really looks a lot like ours, doesn't it? Um, this is a little folded because of artifacts, but the lens and the cornea, there's some differences, even some profound differences. But it looks a lot like our eye. But you can't look at this orbit and not say, what on earth are these things and this thing? This thing is called the optic lobe. That's where all the visual processing, all the visual work goes on. The eye is merely one that receives light and sends the image to the optic lobe. And surprisingly, the optic lobe, histologically, under a microscope, looks a lot like our inner retina. This is convergent evolution. The same kind of processing has to go on to assemble an image. And it goes on here rather than the back of the eye like it does in our eye. But what on earth are these things? These are called 
called white bodies. No surprise there. White bodies produce blood. This is essentially marrow, marrow producing tissue. But they don't have blood like we do. They have copper based blood, not hemoglobin based blood, not iron based. Copper based blood does not hold oxygen as well as iron. So in order to make up for that, they have three hearts. One centrally, two peripherally. So they have found another way to oxygenate, not as efficient as ours, but they've found another way to oxygenate. So I thank the Monterey Bay Aquarium for the specimen. We've learned a lot from it. There's more to, to talk about. I'm going to save you some of those details. Uh, I've written about the other issues um, if you're interested. But this creature is perhaps one of the most interesting to me because it's a pivotal organism. And some of you had this last night for dinner. This is a scallop. And you'll say, doesn't look like any scallop I had on my plate, right? When the fishmonger strips scallops, and he or she will strip out this mantle, he also strips out these blueberry-like excrescences. And each one of these are eyes. Scallops will have from 40 to 100 eyes, depending on the species. And each one of these eyes has a pupil, and it reacts to light. What does it look like if you look at the inside of that eye? Well, most interestingly, it has an unusually shaped lens, and this focuses well. Uh, actually, I should say it reflects and focuses well right behind the lens. Why does that happen? This is lined, the back of the eye is lined with wanting. It makes a mirror. So this is mirror optics. This is this schmidt cassegrain telescope I mentioned earlier. The rays come in and are bent by the lens. They strike the back mirror, but they're not in focus. They're separated. But they're reflected. They come in focus immediately behind the lens. Why? What would it do with this? It has two different retinae, two, two retina, two layers of photosensitive cell. One here and one here. This one's artifactually detached. I can't help that in detached in preparation. But why does it have two retina? We just have one. Well, not only does it have two, but one of them is very much like your retina in its cell type, and another one is like the invertebrate retina. Different retina, different kind of retina, different kind of cells. This is a pivotal organism showing that genetically, most creatures are, even today, capable of producing either form of cell. And in fact, in your own eye, you have echoes of the previous invertebrate photoreceptive cells. They're called melanopsin cells. I'm not going to get into the detail, but the point is we each carry the echoes of that early division, probably in about a, a worm um, that had, had both been divided. So this is an example of an animal that uses complex optics to focus light on two different retinae. Well, what does it do with that information? It has no brain. It has only ganglion. One retina fires with light, and one fires with darkness. So that means it's always firing, some baseline firing. It, too, is a burglar alarm. If there's clouds going over and it's, it's sort of a diffuse environment, um, it recognizes that there's no sharp borders, not black or white. So it keeps its bivalve open, and it continues to filter feed. But if there's a very sharp shadow right close to it, a predator, then it will snap shut and begin to squirt away by virtue of the fact that that sharp shadow is immediately turning one retina on and off. Now, the dawn of vertebrates uh, probably interests us a bit more. Uh, the Cambrian appeared at the time of the Cambrian appeared. This creature appeared. This is a Hykuella. Shows a couple of eyes, impressions of the eyes. And about this time, Hykuella evolved into the lamprey. Or should I say hagfish and then the lamprey. And the lamprey begins to have now an eye that looks much more like a fish eye or like our own eye. This would then lead from the end of the um, the Cambrian into the Devonian, where fish would be predominant. The hagfish and the, the uh, lampreys, um, they would begin to evolve and spread into different, different kinds of fish, different styles of fish. About this time, sharks would appear. And sharks in the form of rays and other sharks would evolve the first rods. That is, 
cells that we can see in uh, dimmer light. It's about 450 million years ago, and about that time, lungfish, the fish that would later evolve into tetrapods, also appeared. And fish proliferated. Even now, there are still 28,000 species of fish. This would then be the Devonian. You'd have the, the, um, the sharks and the rays appear, and the lungfish, key point. But lots of other fish evolved. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on their eyes, because they were often very similar to one another, at least what we know about them. But this is also a key period for terrestrial species. That is, species that would come on land. First, you'd have liverworts and mosses that would come onto land. You'd then have the um, feeding organisms that would follow them, and then dragonflies and spiders would follow them. The tetrapods would then appear following the insect prey. So you'd have dragonflies and spiders appearing first, and the, these animals would probably appear several times. And this would require key neurologic changes. Remember that water as an interface will interfere with the bending of light rays, so you have to change what the eye looks like. So, spiders were probably first up, and they changed the eyes by developing a telescope. And you can see a lens and a second pit here uh, in the length of the eyes is cutting through the head of a jumping spider. And you can see how this spider has evolved essentially a telescope to increase its ability to see on land. Now, I'm asked, what is it like in the Devonian? What was the late Devonian like with terrestrial and sea creatures? And this is an artist's rendition. You can see these odd creatures, and probably Acanthostega. Note the six or seven digits. That probably did not radiate into us. But it was an early amphibian. And it is the amphibians, then, that help us understand the radiation of tetrapods and later into us. The amphibians would evolve about 375 million years ago. And the eyes came from the sides to the center. And by this time, they had to develop binocularity, or stereopsis, which they did. They developed steeper, smoother optics. The cornea becomes steeper, becomes clearer, so that they can see better with the air interface as opposed to a water interface. But they still use the same mechanisms that fish use to focus. Eyelids would appear, tear ducts would appear. These animals were partially aquatic, but mostly terrestrial. So they needed some way to wet the surface and then drain away the tears. So eyelids and tears would, uh, uh, tear ducts would appear. Also, interestingly enough, that third eyelid you see in your dog, your, your other pets, we don't have. Uh, a third eyelid would appear because this was a uh, a mechanism to clean and, and to wet the surface of the eye. The lids weren't particularly good at this stage. Now, the frogs are wedded to water, and they must lay their eggs in water. A key step that occurred called the cladoic egg, that is, eggs became hardened, leathery, shelled, and with that, you could then develop the first reptiles. Now, these are called cotylosaurs, but it doesn't matter about the name. They're basal reptiles that will radiate into a couple of directions. The shelled egg would be the key part to this. So there are two lineages, the sauropsids and the synapsids. The sauropsids, and we'll talk about what each of those two, you'll recognize the names of where that radiated in a moment. The sauropsids had two lineages, uh, that is the reptiles in one direction, the crocs and the turtles, and then the lizards and the snakes in another direction. We'll come back to the uh, synapsids because that's us. Since these animals were no longer wed to water, and they were constantly terrestrial animals, now they could change the, the difference, change the mechanism of focusing. So they have a different mechanism of focusing, focusing, very much like our mechanism now, by changing the shape of the lens, called lens deformation. And this would be important, because that gives us a larger image, a sharper image, a faster image. No animal that is on land and spends its time on land has any fish-like accommodated mechanism, mechanism of focusing. They all use the focusing mechanism of the reptiles because it's faster, better, more efficient. Even accommodation would change. Even accommodation would evolve. And this is an image of a chameleon eye. And notice how the lens looks very odd. Instead of being a 
a fat round lens you're all familiar with in physics, this one is a minus lens, it's curved. So even lenticular evolution would take place as these animals would perfect the kind of vision, the kind of image uh, that they needed. I mentioned there were two divisions in the reptiles, and the second division after the lizards, the second division will be the crocs and the turtles. The crocodiles would appear about 250 million years ago. This would be a, an arm called the archosaurs, and this would radiate into the dinosaurs. Birds would later evolve from a single arm of the dinosaurs, so we still have some dinosaurs with us. But about that same time, a reptile that is still with us, known as a tuatara, arose. And this gives us a real clue into what the early dinosaurs looked like and the early reptiles looked like. Even though it has evolved some, it still resembles the creatures that were alive then, and this is an image of it. This is only found on islands off the coast of New Zealand. Um, it's been extirpated by uh, cats and foxes, feral animals. The tuatara then uh, tells us what animals looked like at the time. And what it had that is important for us to understand is the third eye. And if you're going to have a third eye, you're going to need a third eye cornea. And right here it is. You can see that little clear disc in the center of that scale. And if you are to cut straight through that, you'd see that this looks very much like an eye. So this is a third eye of the tuatara, but it's actually unlike our own. It's arranged differently, anatomically it arises differently, its embryology is different. It's not used for sight at all, but rather used for circadian rhythm. It helps tell the animal when to mate, uh, when to migrate, uh, when to feed. So that third eye, and we have only an echo of it at all, that third eye was important and probably present in the dinosaurs as well. Now the reptiles would then radiate into one more group that would be interesting, and that's the snakes. Some of the reptiles would go underground, and that's called becoming fossorial. They would then emerge from being fossorial at about 95 million years ago, and they would have to relearn how to do accommodation. They'd lost much of the ability of the eye because it went underground, the eye began to atrophy. So they have a completely different mechanism of focusing, and the only one of its kind proving its fossorial journey. Now, snakes, as they rose from being underground, didn't have as good a vision as, as they might want. So they developed other tools. And one of the other tools would be that of infrared vision. So particularly the pit vipers have the ability to see infrared, but so does the boa I just had in the previous image. Now, infrared vision, you've probably seen on Discover Channel, you'll see a small mammal running through the undergrowth and this, the snake is visualizing it in infrared. You see a little red animal running through that. That is probably what really happens. The infrared image is integrated into the visual system, so they truly see into the infrared. Uh, it's hard for us to explain or imagine because we don't have that skill. Now, since snakes went underground, they had to protect their eye, and they did to some extent. So what they did was they fused their outer lids. And here's an example of this so-called spectacle and the secretions they have in between the spectacle and the cornea to keep it lubricated. And here's an example using uh, ocular coherence tomography, some of the magic instrumentation we can now use on our own, uh, own human eyes and human eye problems. This is that same cornea and that same spectacle. Sometimes these snakes have trouble losing the spectacle, so they develop a spectalitis, uh, they get an infected spectacle. Now, I mentioned that the dinosaurs would radiate into a very special dinosaur. Archaeopteryx appeared about 150 million years ago, and these are much closer to the crocodiles and the dinosaurs. Other reptiles would radiate in other directions, and I won't touch on those today. But Birds are the best visual system on Earth, and their adaptations will prove it. And they're really important to, to birds and their, their niches. They're neurologically more complex than our own eyes because they have to deal with the speed of flight, often have to deal with high speed, like a falcon, high speed uh, trying to uh, attack its prey. So it's neurologically complex, and that evolved as well. Most of them, I should say some of them, have two areas within each eye of sharp vision. You read the newspaper with one area of sharp 
uh, vision called the fovea. Many of them have two areas in each eye. So you can see they've evolved several special mechanisms so that they can do things like this uh, white fronted bee eater. They can feed on other flying insects. They can feed like uh, the herons uh, below uh, uh, reflexes on um, water. They, they can actually penetrate the, the water visually. Or they can pound on, on uh, trees and make holes without developing headaches, as was hinted in the Ig Nobel discussion earlier. So this is really the triumph. Birds are eye-minded. They have large eyes. They focus very rapidly. They have very fast muscle fibers. They have a plexus of blood vessels within their eye to feed the eye rapidly and efficiently. And they have more densely packed cells than we do. In your best part of vision, the fovea, you have about 250,000 square uh, uh, cells per square millimeter. They have up to a million. So you can see the better visual acuity that many birds enjoy. Now, we're more interested, though, in the mammals. And those are the synapsids. That was that other arm I mentioned. The synapsids would appear about 286 million years ago. The mammals in their kin, they started out as a monotreme, egg-laying mammals, more basal. They have more features in common with the reptiles. Uh, the marsupials, you know from Australia and even one in North America. But about 125 million years ago, mammals, placental mammals, would first appear, and yet they would not really have their day until about 65 million years ago when the meteor struck at Chicheloo. The echidna, or spiny anteater, one of the monotremes, uh, lays eggs, uh, doesn't have mammary glands or, or uh, any kind of way to deliver milk, so its, uh, its young will lick milk off of its fur. So you can see the developing mammalian traits uh, in this animal. The marsupials, illustrated here by the fat-tailed dunnert, uh, illustrate that they have more visual pigments than we do, suggesting that at the time of this radiation, uh, all the color vision that was eventually lost to our lineage was not yet lost. But as animals, the placental mammals, begin to ascend into the trees, they lost the visual pigments that were bequeathed to us by the fish. Fish gave us four visual pigments. By the time primates appeared, there would be only two left. And those two visual pigments would suffice for almost all of the mammals until the old world monkeys would appear. Now, the primate ancestor, the proto-primate, probably had two visual pigments, much like your dog that has two visual pigments, or for some males who have only two visual pigments. So we have three, most of us have three. So the, the two visual pigments would limit the range of color vision. But with the appearance of the old world monkeys, trichromacy, or three visual pigments, developed. Why? Probably because of competition. These monkeys were, were concentrated in Africa, old world monkeys, and they had greater competition for leaves, for fruit, so they developed this third visual pigment. However, by this time, Gondwana land had split, and that same protoprimate was present in South America, and the new world monkeys there did not have trichromacy. They didn't develop three visual pigments. They still had two, except for the howlers. And the howlers, ge geologically, have recently developed three visual pigments, starting with the females, then spreading to the males. So most of the South American, the New World monkeys, still have only two visual pigments. And yet all of the Old World monkeys have three. So what, what happened? What was the pivotal point? It was the competition on Africa. When you say, that's OK, but what about Madagascar? Because there, the primates, the lemurs, do not have three visual pigments. They have but two. Madagascar split off before that proto-primate was able to evolve three in Africa. So the lemurs on Madagascar are left with but two visual pigments. And they have the genetic mechanisms to develop three, but they have never done so. They don't have the appropriate competition. I think what I've shown you today is that there is a spectacular array of eyes radiating from that single collection of 
retinol, visual purple into a cell membrane. There are pinholes, there are multi-element lenses, mirror, mirrored lenses, aspheric lenses, various combinations, and the neurologic machinery that accompanies it would follow this sensory input. We have unusual pupillary arrangements. We have spectacular designs that permit each animal in its own niche to have what it needs to fulfill and solve its own problems. The largest eye on Earth, in, at least in the vertebrates, appeared in the ichthyosaurs. For animals like this one, ophthalmosaurus, bigger than a double-decker bus, that would dive to, to depths of about 1,000 meters. So the eye enlarged so it could pick out animals with bioluminescence. Each animal would evolve to its own niche. Or the build fishes that would develop large muscles in their orbit. And these large muscles, these muscles would be the size of a, uh, a large strap with uh, the uh, eye being the size of a, a tangerine. What this does is it allows these muscles to be heaters and heat both the brain and the eye so that as the Build fish would dive to collect a school of fish. It would still maintain a warm eye and a warm brain for processing. Now next I'm going to show you, as I click to the next slide, I'm going to show you a CT scan of one of these um, build fish. And you can see these large muscles as they go through the orbit. Uh, this is, these were important for the feeding mechanism, the niche that the animal has. Brain appears, and now the orbits begin to appear. And notice the size of these large muscles. It's bigger than a large piece of sushi. And note the eyes appear, the thin septum to, to the brain, so that the eyes, you know, the muscles can continue to, to heat the brain. So I think what I can what I can tell you is that the eye can evolve quickly and has done so many times, perhaps in as little as a million years, in many different directions. Some of the basic eye molecules, compounds, appeared only once, and they appeared right at the beginning. And they didn't change because they were affected, they were built upon. But these are the basic eye molecules. These are highly conserved because they worked, they were efficient, um, and necessary. Some of the proteins, though, are much younger, like the lenses, so they were cobbled together as animals would need them for their particular niche. And you can see that a vast array of these designs has arisen. What I can also say is that vision is a driver of evolution. That doesn't mean that vision is the driver of evolution. It only means that it's a significant input to where evolution goes. It's a proxy for sensory mechanisms. It didn't even appear first. Smell probably appeared first. But vision, because of its importance, because of its long distance ability, because of its its ability to make a predator a better predator and a prey a better defensive prey uh, as a proxy has probably driven the direction of evolution. I want to thank you. This is a great honor to, um, uh, to be here and speak on this topic. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions. I have two requests. One, uh, I'm going to go right from uh, from Tam here. Please make sure your question is in the form of a question. <laughs> two, no multi-part questions. We're going to have about um, 15 minutes for questions. So, and the people who are going to ask questions. The microphone's right over to the speaker's right. Lights. Oh, the house lights. Yeah, can someone bring up the house lights? Yeah, the lights up might help. Thank you. 3.75 billion years in an hour and 10 minutes. That's, uh, <laughs> and you thought six. I was going to talk for six hours, didn't you? Yeah. All right, if there are no questions, I will have. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go for it. Regarding 65 million years ago, we're already aware of the impact of the meteor 
off of Yucatan, which clouded up the earth, killed off 80% of whatever. And that, was, that would seem to be the lack of radiation. Uh, what is your radiation 65 million years ago? I'm unaware of that. The radiation would have been of mammals. Uh, the 65, the strike of Chichilub 65 million years ago killed off the larger animals, the dinosaurs, all except the birds. And it probably killed off um, a, a lot of other species as well. Not as bad as a Permian, but quite a few other animals. It killed off the competition. So the small, furtive, uh, mammalian-like creatures, like a shrew, shrew-like animal, no longer had to compete with the dinosaurs. They could both enlarge as well as have access to food. Uh, why didn't they die off? Why did the dinosaurs die off and they didn't? Complex answer, not completely known, but the dinosaurs were dying off to some extent before the meteor strike. So there may have been other factors, but clearly animals of that size would lose access to vegetation, uh, perhaps access to mating, whereas animals that did well in the darkness probably weren't as much affected. So it probably had to do with the niche they were filling at the time and they were able to successfully get through that, that window and then expand, then radiate into to myriad other species. Yes. Um, maybe I just misunderstand. Um, the original protein or pigment that was light receptive is retinin. Is there a relationship? Is there a relationship at all? And what is, what is it with retinin and other light receptive pigments, say chlorophyll? Okay. Um, question is uh, regarding other visual pigments. There are actually several other visual pigments that might work. Uh, one of them is used by coral. It's called cryptocones. And it's a flavin-based uh, um, photoreceptive compound. Resinol, which is the vitamin A compound used in what I call visual purple for the sake of uh, discussion. Retinol is the compound. And it is um, very efficient, it's more efficient than flavin, um, more efficient than melanopsin. Some of the other choices that could have come along probably were in competition with retinol, but probably selected. Uh, retinol was probably selected because of its efficiency as a proton pump, not as a visual mechanism. In other words, it transferred energy from the outside to the inside, giving the cell a better advantage. So it was selected not because it was good visually, but because it was good um, as an energy source. Is there a link with all those and chlorophyll? Chlorophyll. Um, good, good question. I don't know, and I think the answer is no. Chlorophyll was not selected. Only one animal, a fish, uses chlorophyll, and it doesn't, doesn't get it except from eating certain copepods. So uh, chlorophyll was discarded, at least by the by metazoa, I should say, by the animalia, because uh, obviously plants have picked it up. But there's no relationship to those proteins or those molecules like vitamin A and chlorophyll. Not that I know of. Well, I've forgotten some of my elementary biology, but uh, how prevalent is the inverted retina and how did it come about? Yeah, inverted retina, um, I didn't get into a lot of the details and you'll be really glad I didn't, but what, he, <laughs> what he's getting at is that the octopus I talked to you about, the photoreceptor, that is the cell that, that receives the light and sends a signal, has the business end of its cell pointing towards the lens. So as the light comes in, it passes through the lens and strikes the photoreceptor element immediately. That's called an everted retina. We have an inverted retina. In other words, light has to pass through all the layers of the retina to the photoreceptor before it can get to the photoreceptor elements. Now, it's easy to understand, or easier to understand, how the octopus eye might form from a simple eye spot. It just folds up into a cup. But why do we have this inverted retina, which is less efficient? It creates a risk of retinal detachments, other problems within the eye, uh, so why is it formed that way? And it probably has to do with the, where the compound that we use, retinol, was stored in that stem organism, which was a worm, probably a worm. And the worm would radiate into the invertebrates, which included the mollusks, which would include an everted retina, but also then radiated, radiated 
into the um, vertebrates, which would be us. It, that particular worm that would then give off um, the vertebrate lineages probably had it inside the brain rather than the eye spot. The eye spot probably had the, the invertebrate photoreceptive pigment called um, a rhabdomeric cell, probably had it inverted. But the cell inside the brain then probably had to e invert to become an eye, to float to the surface. But that's not well worked out. There are really uh, not a lot of good explanation for why it folded. It's not the most efficient way. It did, though. Other questions? Um, with box jellyfish that had an eye, which from what I gather was essentially a camera type eye. Which kind? What? The box jellyfish you mentioned? Yes, the box jellyfish had, has, a, uh, has a camera style eye. Could you talk a little bit about what it could do with those images since it lacked a brain? Is this a case where it's, it's actually got more information coming in than it can actually use? And if so, why would a camera type eye evolve in such a, a creature that can't use that information? Yeah, it does use the information. I mentioned there were four ropilia, four bell cords, and as the light comes in, there are six eyes in each one of the ropilia. One eye looks up at its bell, so it can look at what it, what it eats. Now, if you knew what it eats, you wouldn't want to be looking at it, but it does. The other animal looks out for uh, collections of light, because it, it, what it feeds on is uh, copepods, and so it looks for a shaft of light where the copepods will congregate. So this isn't great imagery, but it's able to, to focus on and then go to um, debris or animals in a light shaft. Now, in terms of what it, how it does this, there's no brain, but there is a, a ganglion um, rim, and what it sends a signal from the individual eye to this series of ganglia, and as the, as the signal goes round, the ganglia that hits first may cause one of the tentacles to push away and others to to pull forward. So it's a simply a reflex, and the reflex is light-driven on where the most light hits these individual cells. It's a little like, oh, a little like striking your knee with um, a reflex hammer. It's simply, um, as your knee is struck, your, your leg kicks out. As light strikes one portion of this eye, the tentacle will kick out or, or kick backwards. So it uses the combination of light, depending on which one's focus, to change direction. But it's not a sophisticated eye, and it doesn't interpret the, the, uh, um, the image, doesn't interpret the signal. What would you say to the uh, proponents who, of creation uh, intelligent uh, design who say that the, uh, there is such a thing as irreducible complexity? and they used a mouse trap as an example where seven parts individually cannot function as a mouse trap, and so there would be no evolutionary gradient to cause the mouse trap to evolve. How would you apply that argument or counter that argument when that applies to the, such a complex thing as an eye? Okay. Um, I was actually anticipating that question and have a short video to show you. <laughs> I'm going to show you this short video, and it'll be done in about three hours. Um, <laughs> what, you, what you need to look for, yeah, yeah you need to turn that off. What you need to look for in the video is in the upper, let's see, it'll be the upper left-hand corner will be the number of generations, and you'll see the primitive eye spot forming into a complete eye. And the number of generations in the corner, you should realize um, you know, the numbers are big, 50, 60, 70,000 generations, but realize that the animals that have an eye spot may have a generational time of four to six years, two years. So an eye can, depending on your calculations, the model for this can be a little half a million to a million years an eye can form. You have to know about genetic drift, and genetic drift means that there are errors in the replication of DNA and those errors. It's black right now, so that's okay. <laughs> it's supposed to be black, because uh, it'll come up with the movie in just a second. No? no? Okay, well, it, it, okay. Um, the, the generational time, 
depends both on the animal, but also on, I was talking about genetic drift. I want to go back to genetic drift for a minute. Genetic drift, at about 1%, particularly at the time these animals uh, were first appearing, 1% means that you have 1% error per generation. Now, most of these will die off. There'll be errors that won't, they won't be profitable to the animal, or um, if they uh, are in some way profitable, they may not uh, magnify, they may not work, uh, but some will work. And if you take the worst case scenario, the number of generations in the 50 to 60,000 range will produce each step of what I'm about to show you. So this is how an eye can go from an eye spot to an eye. There you go. Again, generational time in the uh, generations in the upper left-hand corner. Notice you've got an eye spot, cup forms, pigment begins to form. Surface change, the cornea could appear any time, but I have it appear early. Again, it depends on the genetic drift. Now, the eye is beginning to deepen. You're going to begin to get an iris. The lens begins to appear. Remember, a lens appears late. Another eye may appear also at the same time. Generational time, although it seems like a long time, geologically, 60,000 generations is but a blink. So it gives you an idea of how you can take an irreducibly complex eye and make it in about a million years if you assume genetic drift at the same rate we see it now. In fact, it was probably faster at that time because the DNA was less stable than it is now. The errors had been worked out to a large extent. So this, um, this is an example of how an eye can form from an eye spot to an eye cup to an eye cup with a lens, to an eye cup with a lens and a cornea, to an eye cup with a lens, a cornea, and forward-facing eyes. You can turn the light on when I go for any other question. Did that answer the question, by the way? Are you happy with that? Or not? We've got time for one more question. The last one. Okay, uh, scallops. You, you, you said that scallops were pivotal in evolution, and you, you used some examples. And one of them was that humans have uh, the remains of a primitive retina. Okay. Can you expand that? Okay. Um, first of all, I apologize for having the amount of material that I, I presented. It's a lot of material, and if you don't have a, a, a science background. Some of the words and some of the concepts may be um, uh, a little hard to grasp. I try to explain this uh, in my book, but it gets to be a little difficult because you have to, several of the terms you have to explain. Um, scallops have two different retina. One retina called ciliary retina. Now your cells are ciliary cells. That means the cells in your retina are ciliary. You have ciliary cells. The insects have rhabdomeric cells. It's just a different concept of how the cell works, how the cell looks histologically. But we use those two words, rhabdomeric for invertebrates, ciliary for vertebrates. Now, it turns out that scallops did not have two retinae all along their evolutionary course. They popped up with this later. So they have just expressed it indicating they have the DNA polymorphisms, the ability to express these two different retinas. I don't know quite why they did, but I told you what they did. So here's an invertebrate that expressed a vertebrate retina and produces a vertebrate retina. The concept then is turned around. Well, that means that almost all animals will have the ability to create invertebrate retina as well as vertebrate retina. So that means we ought to have the ability to produce an invertebrate retina. But we don't really. Our genes are too far along, we're locked in. But we still have the echoes of what that represents. We have in our own retina a subset of cells in our, in our third order neurons. That is the neurons, after the cell gives off a signal, you've got another layer of cell, and then you've got a cell that goes directly to the brain sends a signal. That's called a ganglion cell. So the ganglion cells in our retina transmit the image. We have a subset of ganglion cells that are melanopsin cells that resemble both, not physically, but resemble biochemically 
that invertebrate, invertebrate rabbi cells. The first worm that this was shown in, a worm called, uh, um, it's a ragworm, I'll think of it in a second. Again, I have it written up. The first worm this was found in, just found a few years ago, discovered that it has an eye spot with the rhabdomeric cells, invertebrate retina cells, and inside its brain it has ciliary cells. So you say, well, it has both capabilities, and that may be the key to why we have an inverted retina as well. But those ciliary cells then, for the vertebrate line surface to become lateralized, but the rhabdomeric cells didn't go away. They became internalized within the eye, and they developed into melanopsin-containing cells. They have these same melanopsin cells, the ganglion cells, have other chemicals in the cascade of visual production that closely resemble those in an invertebrate retina, meaning that they don't see like the ciliary cells you have in most of the rest of the retina. But it's just a tiny subset, and it's thought to be used by us for circadian rhythm, for telling light and dark, and may contribute to why you have trouble with jet lag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, you know. okay, folks, a couple of announcements before we are set loose on the cake, and uh, I'm going to ask Ron Silva to come up here for a presentation for the speaker. Just a small thank you um, from the committee for Dr. Schwab and its great presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Also, um, I want to make an announcement as well. I, I do not know, since I'm looking at the table now, where, the, uh, where Dr. Schwab's books are. It looks like there's a few left. Um, I'm sure he would sign them if you asked him. Am I right? Yes, thank okay. you. Uh, so feel free, while you're looking at the cake or destroying the cake, to pick up a copy of the speaker's book as well. So we're going to uh, set you loose on the cake, and we, we hope you enjoy the time we have left. Thank you very much.